with the cosmic. Why not? Um, there are four, I think it's 4,000 billion observable galaxies now. Anyone who claims to know a lot about all of these has sources of information denied to me, but we know a little bit about them and a lot more than we used to do. And Edwin Hubble noticed rather famously a few decades ago that they're all moving away from each other rather rapidly. That's what they call the red light problem or observation. Very rapidly indeed, in fact. Um, now, this has very important implications because it was thought until nine years ago that because of gravitational factors, that rate of expansion would surely by now be slowing. They'd still be expanding, moving away from each other fast, but less fast all the time. No, the rate is going up. The speed is, is increasing. Uh, Lawrence Krauss has a wonderful piece in the upcoming Scientific American on this absolutely crucial point. It means that within measurable time, there will be no signs left in the observable universe that the Big Bang ever occurred at all. Everything will have disappeared out of sight. Uh, there will be no markers, uh, nothing to take observations from. I mention this because it's often said that how can, um, how can uh, something come out of nothing? It's the clever, clever question every religious demagogue and businessman always begins by asking you. Well, we know we've got a bit of something in this universe, and we know nothingness is coming. So some design, huh? Nothingness is not just innate, programmed. It's the next big thing. And we at least had some somethingness. As if to make assurance doubly sure, the Andromeda galaxy is headed directly, directly in collision course with our own. Measurably, it's already filling. The sky can be seen with the naked eye. In five billion years, which is to say fucking soon, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> it's on us. And if it hasn't happened before then, our sun goes into a red giant, then a red dwarf. We become a crisp. Um, that'll be nothingness programmed instead of somethingness. Some design, huh? Well, let's move then, while you ponder that, to the tiny suburb in which we actually do know we live, this little corner, just our solar system. Every other rock in our solar system is completely inhospitable to life, either too hot or too cold, as is most of our planet, which, as we know, have good cause to know is on a knife edge of climatic survival as we speak. We, we could become extinct at, at any moment. In fact, when we still lived on the savannah, of Africa, the, the environment to which we were adapted and have fled, but where we still betray the scars of our lowly origin by the coat of fur we grow in the womb and then shed by the appendix, uh, by our terrible dentition and by many other things. Our adrenal glands are too big, our prefrontal lobes are too small. We're not the finest primates that could have evolved. Um, very, it's estimated by the people who've done the DNA work on this that we were down as a species to less than a few thousand because of climatic events and, and other uh, nightmares and catastrophes before the decision was made to abandon the savannah and seek uh, cooler uh, territory, we could very easily have joined the 99.9% .9 of every other species that has ever been in existence on this tiny planet and become extinct. That close. What are we flattering ourselves about? What is so great about our anthropic principle that we should attribute this to a design or a designer? Some design, huh? and some designer too. Who but a serf wants it to be true? Here's what you have to believe to be a theist. <clears throat> For 100,000 years, humanity is born. Perhaps 25% perhaps of it dies in childbirth, or very shortly afterwards. Life expectancy, I don't know, 25 for a very long time. Infant mortality, extraordinary, after, after childbirth deaths, I mean. Um, killed by microorganisms we didn't know existed. Uh, by earthquakes that we thought were portents, by storms that we didn't know came from our climate system, by other events that arise from being born onto a cooling planet with deep cracks in its crust, faults in its crust. Then man-made things, turf wars, <clears throat> fights over women, fights over territory, over food, and so on. Very, very slow, gradual, exponential upward progress, we might, we might like to think. Pretty slow, um, and, but at least we can claim out of our own self-respect, man-made. For, and for the first 96,000 years of this experience, heaven watches with folded arms. Us go through this with indifference, without pity. And then around 4,000 years ago decides, gee, it's time to intervene. <laughs> and the best way of doing that would probably be in Bronze Age Middle East, <laughs> making appearances to stupefied illiterate peasants which could later be passed on. The news would get to China after about a thousand years of that.
Um, well, 98.9% of the, all the species that have ever been on Earth are extinct now. And whatever process it was uh, that set this in motion or kept it going, uh, the process of, of um, evolution and natural selection from which we have so self-evidently evolved is a very pitiless one. It doesn't seem to be one that makes very many discriminations or chooses which species is to survive or which to be uh, condemned. <clears throat> Stephen Jay Gould, in his wonderful uh, book on the Burgess Shale, makes a, which, which I have an allusion or two, makes a very uh, telling and I sometimes think chilling um, analogy. He says, if you could, if you could put the, the tree, or he says more like a bush of uh, evolution, of the, the paleontolo paleontological remains that you find have gone off on a branch that ended up nowhere. It doesn't go up, in other words, in an ascent. It, it goes out, fans out in a long bush line. If you could, as it were, run all that back onto a tape, then play that tape again, there's absolutely no guarantee that it comes out the same way. Another branch could have th thriven as ours might have, have withered. That's how random it is. Uh, evolution doesn't know we're here. It didn't, it didn't intend us to arrive here. It won't notice if we go. It will never know we were here. The stars look down, that's all they do. They don't care. As, as W. H. Jordan says, a wonderful poem, in which the rather marvelous remark is made, if affections unequal be, let the more loving one be me, which Joseph Brodsky said could itself become the basis of a religion of love. Anyway, the poem begins by saying, looking up at the stars, I know quite well that for all they care, I can go to hell. Religion is a, a combination of, of debasement and servility. I'm returning to a point I made earlier with the most extraordinary solipsism. I'll try and put that uh, better. Uh, in return for your being told that you sinned before you were born, we had a quick refresher on that just now. You sinned, you committed crimes that are original to your species, that we, for which you have no direct responsibility, but for which you cannot shake yourself. You're born guilty, created sick, commanded to be well, as Fulk Gravel puts it. And that in the Quran, you're told you're made out of a clot of blood <coughs> by your creator. In the Bible, it's from the dust, and then women uh, wrenched uh, even from that rather muddy, imperfect uh, creation as a lesser species. All this, um, and that you must go, as we all used to have to do, and confess your sins, say, mercy on me, a miserable sinner, wretched, guilty, unworthy. In return for that humiliation, in return for this total abolition of your of your self-respect, this conviction of having done wrong, you're told, but there's good news. The universe, the whole constellation, the whole, the whole celestial globe, the whole thing was designed with you in mind. So you can be from someone totally abject and totally shamed, a complete solipsist, a raging egomaniac, the center of the universe, someone for whom it's all been planned. And not only that, but God has a plan for you too. And not only that, he was prepared to subject one of his children to revolting torture uh, to prove his love. If you'd been present when that sacrifice, that human sacrifice was going on, you would have been in duty bound to try and stop it. But if you did, you wouldn't have been saved. If you'd done the moral thing and said, stop this now, I can't watch a human sacrifice, I can't watch someone being crucified, stop it. No, you do that, you've missed your chance for salvation. This is madness. This is madness. And how many generations of humans went by not even knowing of this fantastic idea, dying in misery and ignorance and shame before it was suddenly decided, maybe I'll, I'll torture a son to death today and rescue the rest of them. Who can believe this? It's, it's an insult, it seems to me, to, to self-respect in both ways. It hugely aggrandizes our importance in the scheme of things, and it greatly uh, diminishes us uh, as autonomous individuals. It belongs, as I say, to our, to our childhood. Now, <coughs> Um, that, that God should have watched this species suffering, dying in childbirth, life expectancy of about 20 years, swept with plague, famine, misery, uh, shame, mystery, dying in Brazil, dying in China, dying in Australia, countries not known to any of the writers of these testaments. They're animals not even known by it, 
and to have decided only a few thousand years ago, maybe it's time to intervene? Have a son of mine torn to shreds in a remote part of Bronze Age Palestine? Let the Chinese wait a few thousand years to find out that that's what happened. That should make them love each other. It's not to be believed. No serious person can believe it. 